of the bias, or the media, or the fear, to know what actually is fact and what is fiction concerning the Affordable Care Act. So this evening we welcome Dr. William Hathaway, perhaps his uh, uh, biggest credential in Wapaka, <laughs> is that he is the son of Dr. David Hathaway, a uh, trustee of Winchester. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. William Hathaway, a cardiologist and a hospital administrator from Asheville, North Carolina, to help us understand what is fact and what is fiction. Dr. Hathaway received his bachelor's degree at Middlebury College in Vermont, his medical degree from the Medical School of Wisconsin in the Milwaukee area, and he did his internship and his residency at Duke University Medical Center. The program this evening, we are grateful. We thank Mary Ellen Borio. She is the uh, sponsor of uh, this evening's program. <laughs> we welcome Dr. Hathaway. It's a privilege and an honor to be here for a lot of different reasons. Um, I um, have a long-standing family history in this community. I don't know how many people are aware of it, but uh, my uh, lineage goes back to before 1900. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rough crowd. <laughs> um, back before 1900 when my mother's parents uh, 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 my mother's grandparents lived in town, and both my grandparents raised my father and uh, my mother, who's since passed away here in town. My father, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a dentist in town for years and years and years, and uh, my uh, dad's father and family were out at the veterans' home, where he was the chief medical officer and medical director out there for many years before they retired to the southwest. Um, I had the privilege to come back to town where I worked with Dr. Scanlon in Appleton, and uh, he sent me out here to do an outreach clinic for uh, the few years that I was in town. So we have a long-standing history here, and it, it, it really makes me feel good to be here. Um, I, I, I think I must be crazy, because why would you come back home and talk about something as controversial as the Affordable Care Act? Let me tell you a couple things about myself. I'm a cardiologist by training. I'm an administrator by happenstance, and I've only been in this role for seven or eight months. We have a large health system in Western North Carolina. It's a, a 800 bed hospital, and there's five satellite hospitals that we're responsible for, and we care for a very large rural region of Western North Carolina, about uh, 850,000 people. Um, so uh, uh, I, I, I don't come to you as an expert on the Affordable Care Act. In fact, most of what I learned about the Affordable Care Act was in the last two weeks preparing for this talk. <laughs> uh, so um, I come to, uh, to talk to you, and as you can see, it's obviously a problem uh, for us. Next slide, please, Will. Um, it's an issue that's divided the country. And uh, I figured this is either a really good thing or a really bad thing, because no matter how you look at it, if I say some things you like about it, or I say some things you don't like about it, or if you just don't know, at least a third of the audience is going to be on my side, right, the way this slide looks. Um, what's interesting about this slide is that, of course, typical of our partisan politics in the United States today, if you're Republican, you're against it, and if you're Democratic, you're leaning for it, but most of us don't really know what it's about. We just decide we're going to be against it. Next slide, if you will. Um, it's, uh, it's got everyone revved up. Um, there's passion on each side of the argument, whether you're, next slide, whether you're a CNN fan or a Fox News fan, whether you're a red voter or a white voter or a blue voter, whether you're pro Obama, next slide, or a no Obama person, uh, there should be something in this talk for, for all of us by the time we're done. So what I hope to do today is a couple things. Number one is, uh, um, give an overview of, of the Affordable Care Act. I don't have answers. I will answer questions as best I can, how it affects me as a cardiologist, how it affects you as uh, consumers of healthcare, how it affects you as taxpayers. We're gonna start out with a little bit of a pretest, 
and I will be calling on individuals in the audience for answers on these questions, so better start getting nervous. Um, uh, we'll then look a little bit of why we need health care reform, and I think that's perhaps the most interesting part of the talk to me is when you sit back and look at what our health care um, is all about, uh, what we're providing and not providing for the citizens of this country, um, at least we should be able to come to consensus that whether we agree that this is the right path to reform or not, at least we need a path for reform. And then we'll look at and you know, understand that the Affordable Care Act is a bill that was signed that's 2,400 pages long, okay? So there's no way that we can possibly talk about everything uh, that's contained in the Affordable Care Act today. So I'm gonna hit a few of the, the major highlights that you've heard about so that you can understand, have better clarification. Hopefully when you walk out of here, when you hear it on CNN or Fox News or NPR or MSN or whatever you listen to, wherever you get your news, um, that you'll have a little bit of a better understanding of what they're talking about. And I'll hopefully take away some of the, the, the hyperbole, take away some of the, the, uh, myths, the myths um, and the fiction that's about it and give you a grounding of what's really in there and what the intent is. And then we'll do a post-test, which will just be the pre-test with the answers. And uh, then we'll have some friendly, I hope, conversation. Uh, no riots or uh, mob activity allowed tonight. All right, so let's start with the pre-test. Question number one, will the health uh, care reform law require nearly all Americans to have health insurance starting in 2014 or pay a fine? And all the questions are the same, no yes or you don't know. Don't, we don't need to show hands, just something to think about. So will it require us to pay a fine or have health insurance? Question number two, will health reform law establish a government panel to make decisions about the end of life care? for people with Medicare, the death panels. <laughs> Question number three, will health reform law give states the option of expanding their existing Medicaid program to cover more low income and uninsured adults? Will it create a law that allows states to expand the Medicaid program? Question number four, Will the, law, will the reform law allow undocumented immigrants to receive financial help from the government to buy health insurance? Undocumented immigrants. Number five, will the health reform law increase the Medicare payroll tax on earnings for upper income Americans? Will there be a tax rate, a tax rate increase associated with this law? Question number six, will the health reform law require employees with uh, employers, excuse me, with 50 or more employees to pay a fine if they don't offer health insurance. Question number seven, will the health reform law cut benefits for people in the traditional Medicare program? And it looks like that's going to be a question you all want to know the answer to, or based, based on the color of the hair, I see. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Or maybe the lack of hair, that's what I'm talking about. Turn 50 this year, it's getting close, okay? <laughs> Will the health reform law provide financial help to low and moderate income Americans who don't get insurance through their jobs to help them purchase coverage? Yes. Question number eight or nine, will the health reform law create a new government-run insurance plan to be offered with the private plans? Question number 10, will the health reform law create health insurance exchanges or marketplaces where small businesses and people who don't get coverage through their employers can shop for insurance, <coughs> compare prices and benefits. Yes. All right, so those are the questions. So let's talk a little bit about healthcare today. What, what's the problem with healthcare uh, in the United States today? Among the many problems that we have, I'll just touch on a few of the highlights that'll sort of create the case, I hope by the time I'm done, for why we need healthcare reform. This is a graph. I'm going to show a lot of graphs and slides. The graphs and slides are all fun. There's a lot of data in them. I'm a data kind of guy, but most of the graphs and slides will boil down to a few salient points, and I'll try to make those points. Uh, if you have any questions, although Dick said no, no questions, I would take a few questions uh, during the, the, the talk if it helps to clarify anything, but uh, I might limit it just so we can get through the whole presentation. Healthcare spending per capita in this country, this is what this slide is. On the, uh, y axis is uh, over time, and x axis is uh, the dollars spent. U.S. costs have gone up exponentially over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years. And what's interesting about this slide is if you compare us to uh, other countries, 
uh, Japan, New Zealand, uh, the Netherlands, Canada, etc., our costs have risen dramatically in comparison uh, to our industrialized uh, peers. So we're spending more over time per person, and that's a problem. We're, our costs are going up much, much faster than they are in other countries. And if you look at this uh, in terms of what our Medicare expenditures are alone, they've just gone up dramatically over the last, uh, since the turn of the century. Uh, we've uh, projected to uh, uh, triple, almost quadruple our costs um, in that 15 year uh, time frame. And that's just not sustainable. We can't keep spending this amount of money uh, on uh, health care uh, without getting anything for it. Next slide, please. If you look at this by age, what happens as we get older? Most of the costs that we spend, most of the costs that we incur in health care happens at the end of life, after our 60th, um, after 60 years when we start to age. Our consumer uh, utilization of healthcare resources rises dramatically. In fact, in our hospital, we've been doing growth projections for the next uh, five years as we're doing a building project. We predict that 70% of all of our growth is going to come not from people moving to the community, but just from everyone there getting older. So it's just as you get older, you use more. It's just the way it goes. Um, bodies tell us that. That's not surprising to most of us. The aches and pains are real. They're not made up and we use more resources as we age. But what's distressing is to compare us to the other Western uh, countries, we're, uh, we're, we're far uh, uh, more steep on the curve of accelerated uh, spending expenditures than they are. Next slide. And if you look at it, it's not just that we spend more overall, you're spending more overall also because your own out-of-pocket expenses are rising dramatically also. Look at this on the bottom. Up to $1,000 a year on expenditure uh, per capita on out of pocket spending I'm, um, uh, uh, versus total spending per, ca per capita. We're way out uh, beyond what our uh, colleagues are in France, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Japan, and Australia. And that spending doesn't come easy to us. It's not like we have the money that we're just easy, to, uh, easy and willing to give it away. It's painful to us. More than $1,000 in out-of-pocket expenses. We're at the far end of the curve there. 36% of us are experiencing that. And when you look at uh, whether we've had problems paying our bills on the uh, far right-hand side of the slide, 27% of us or more are having increasing trouble uh, covering those costs. So it's not just that we're spending more. As a, as a uh, society, we're spending more as individuals, and that's painful and it hurts us. Similar information on this slide, percentage of Americans with high financial burden from healthcare spending is just rising year after year after year. And we've all heard stories about people who have a catastrophic illness, unexpected, they're not insured, they lose their homes, they lose their jobs, they're unable to get the work and they found themselves out after they've saved all their lives, hit their 50s on an unexpected thing. These are real uh, problems that are affecting real people in a real way. And from my point of view, I said it would, I try to be apolitical some things I can't resist. Uh, I think that's wrong. Um, you know, I think as a society, we have a right, we have an obligation uh, to provide health care to everyone in this country. I believe that if we allocate our resources appropriately, that that can be done, and we have to protect uh, the individuals. It's our obligation to people. Uh, this is very interesting data. When you look at uh, what's happened over time um, in terms of insurance premiums versus how uh, workers' earnings are rising, it's just a crime. Workers' earnings rising over time from 1999 to 2012, about a 47% increase in <laughs> adjustment. The workers' contributions to health care premiums has gone up 180%. That money you take home is just, it's being eaten up by health care expenses. Everything that you're, you're taking home is going to, uh, to, to, to cover the health care costs. And if you look at uh, what percent of your income over time is going for a family of four is going towards your health insurance, it's risen from 12% of your income at the turn of the century. That's just, that's just you know, 13 years ago, right? That's crazy. My son's 16 in the front of the audience. He was around that. And now it's up to 30%, from 12% to 30%. So it's really, it's a real, real problem. And that's why we need health care reform. Next slide. Uh, again, just another another way to look at this. This is a slide that, that looks at uh, how workers' um, uh, out-of-pocket uh, spending has increased towards health care dollars, and uh, it looks at workers' earnings on the bottom, and then the cost of administering health care insurance at the top. So our cost just to, to, to administer health care, not what you get, not, not the cost of uh, buying your, your uh, medicine, not the cost of, 
of getting their hospital care, but the cost of managing the health care, of processing the claims, of paying the insurance, that's going up 106% while our earnings are up, have only gone up 29% uh, since the year 2000. So what, what are we spending it on? What is, where, where are the increases? Where is it happening? It's happening across the board, but in hospital care, 8% growth, physician services, 7.9%, nursing home and home health, 6.1%, and then on the far right, the cost of administering health care of private insurance, 12% increase. That's exceeding what it costs for the things we need. And then prescription drugs also going up uh, fairly significantly and rapidly. This is just an example that shows how much we in the United States are addicted to drugs. How much we spend on health care, uh, how much of our health care expenditure is related to the pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry. It's the pharmaceutical spending per capita in 2009. And we averaged about $956 per person on drugs compared to our neighbors, New Zealand being the lowest at $254, and, and Canada, our closest neighbor, both uh, on the chart and, and um, geographically, at $744 per person. We're spending more money per person on drugs. Next slide. And then if you look again more at the cost of healthcare administration, uh, this is a percent of our national health expenditure spent on healthcare uh, administration expenses. Seven and a half percent of all the money we spend, seven and a half percent goes towards things that don't do anything to make us healthier. They don't go towards surgeries, don't go towards medications, don't go towards rehab, don't go towards home health, don't go towards all the things that would make us healthier. We're wasting our money by trying to, all the bureaucracy that's involved in medicine. Next slide, skip this one. All right. So we spend a lot of money. What about the people in the country? What about the uninsured? Let's take a look at that. Uh, 29 million in 2010 adults under age uh, 65 were underinsured. 81 million were either underinsured or uninsured. These are two graphs from 2003 to 2010. The white part of the pie shows the amount of people who were felt to have adequate insurance coverage, either through private uh, plans or through Medicare or Medicaid, but adequate coverage. And you notice two things. Number one, even back in 2003, we had a significant chunk of the pie that didn't either had, uh, were uninsured at some portion during the year or had no insurance or were underinsured. And then in 2010, that chunk of the pie has increased. So we've seen increasing numbers of people lose their insurance or not have adequate insurance. What does it mean to not have adequate insurance? It means you think you're covered, you go in, it's not enough, you still sunk. So you're paying money for insurance instead of a catastrophic event occurs and you don't have enough uh, to pay the bills. Next slide. And who are the uninsured in this country? The vast majority are in this young age group between 21 and 44, and they're uninsured for a lot of different reasons. And we, that, that's a whole talk in and of itself. Sometimes they can't get insurance, sometimes they choose not to buy insurance because of an expense they can't afford. When you look at what percentage of your take home money has to go towards a premium, and you got a family of four, and you're trying to think, how am I gonna pay for gas? How am I gonna put food on the table? How am I gonna buy the backpack so the kid can go to eighth grade with the stuff they need? And they gotta decide, am I gonna do health insurance? Am I gonna do daily living expenses? We make our decisions. And that's not just for the very, very poor. That's for people who, who are making reasonable amounts of money. That's how much our health insurance is chewing up our incomes. But the vast majority fall in this, this age 20 to 40 group. And what happens when you don't have insurance? You don't have insurance, you don't get care. And what happens when you don't get care? You decline a medical test. 62% of people without insurance have been shown to decline a medical test when their doctor says you should get it. 45% may skip a prescription. You know, we're not giving out the drugs just because it's fun to give them out. We think the patients need them, right? And you're not taking them, that means an adverse health status, or they put off the doctor's <laughs> visit. And there's tons of data I can show you over and over and over that if you're uninsured, you're not healthy, you're, you're at risk. You have uh, uh, less likely of succeeding um, in the business world and getting a job, uh, you're much more likely um, to find yourself uh, in financial trouble and behind on your bills for a lot of different reasons. Your health status directly correlates with your socioeconomic status. So, all right, so being unsure is a problem. Uh, the cost of what we do is a problem. What about the prices? What about the charges that we do compared to our neighbors around the, around the planet? Uh, these are a few slides that show not only do we have a problem, we spend too much, but we charge too much for what we do. Physicians' fees in a variety of different countries compared to the United States. Look at this. 
Argentina, Spain, Germany, New Zealand, France, Canada, Chile, Australia, and then in the U.S. for this for an average office visit, ours is average of 86 versus in the 40s uh, in these other countries. Next slide, below. And it's not just office visits; it's also hospital and physician costs. If you get a hip replacement, the average cost for a hip replacement in the United States is $32,000. Fraction of that elsewhere. And people are going elsewhere now to get their health care. How many people have heard of people going to Bangkok or Thailand to get, you know, their back surgery? I had a patient came in just the other day and said she went to Bangkok to get her back operated on. She had no insurance because she was a, a realtor who couldn't afford to buy her own insurance. The company wasn't providing it for her. So she went to Bangkok. She said, I went a week early, took a trip. I went to the hotel, I mean hospital there, but it was like a hotel. They had Ben and Jerry's ice cream, Starbucks coffee, everyone spoke English. The guy who did my back operation got trained at the University of North Carolina, which I said was not too bad a problem since I'm a Duke graduate, but that's okay. Uh, they uh, chauffeured her to and from the airport. The total cost for her week's vacation and her back surgery was $13,000. Okay, she paid it out of pocket, but had she had to pay it here in the United States, this is a hip operation, a back operation would have been the same would have been thirty to forty thousand dollars so we can do better right we've got to be able to do better next slide drugs too look at this how many are on medications i bet almost everyone's on one i'm on two um, i take generic simvastatin uh, i don't pay 125 dollars i steal it off the sample shelf but, uh, <laughs> but the uh the prices are high now you get cut your insurance will cover this if you have a prescription copay but if you don't, it's going to cost you $125. I had a friend of mine who, who had a daughter. She uh, was considering uh, having going on birth control pills. She needed to be on birth control pills. She was sexually active. She went to the doctor. She didn't have insurance. The prescription that they uh, suggested for her would have cost $340 a month. Okay, for a brand name prescription. Yep, and so she chose not to do it. What does that mean? She's uninsured, doesn't get it, so her risk of getting pregnant out of wedlock very high. You don't have insurance, you find yourself in bad situations, whether it's, it's uh, um, that circumstance or others related to your health status. Next slide. And then, this is the one that's, that blows me away. Um, in this country, we uh, incentivize doctors, we incentivize um, people to do tests. We don't pay people to see patients and talk to them in the office. We pay them to do surgeries, we pay them to do tests, we pay them to, you know, things that you can quantitate. It's, a, it's the broken fee-for-service healthcare model. And this is just a classic example of a charge of an MRI scanner in multiple uh, places. I mean, the MRI scanner is made in the same place, okay? They don't make it in Argentina and here, and it costs different. It's made in the same place, costs the same amount of money. Yet the cost that we charge people for the MRI is much higher in this country uh, than it is in others. Uh, next slide. All right. Take a breather here, and let's go to the next question or the next issue. Uh, when you get older, and when we spend our money, we spend the vast majority of our healthcare dollars on a small fraction of the people in the country. On the left is the U.S. population. The top 1% or 1% of the population consumes 22% of the health care dollar. Top 5% consumes 50% of the health care dollar. Top 10%, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, top 10% consumes 65% of the health care dollar. So we, it's not spread evenly, and that's because we're using it at the end of life. We have tremendous amounts of resources put into end-of-life care um, in our last six to 12 months of care. 50% of all the money you, any one of you in, in the audience will spend is likely to occur in the last six months of your life on, on your health care. Is that what we should be doing? Is that, does that make sense? Maybe we should be focusing on wellness and prevention and things to keep us healthy instead of spending it at the end of life. I don't want to get in that debate, okay? That, that's, that's a touchy subject, but it's something to think about. Next slide. And there's huge amounts of waste. This was a survey uh, that looked at, um, asked people what they um, uh, thought about uh, their experience and whether it was wasteful or poorly organized. 23% said um, that the doctor ordered tests had already been done. How crazy is that? Time spent on paperwork related to medical bills and health insurance problem, 26%, that was a waste, said that was a waste. 36% said that the healthcare system was poorly, poorly organized and all of the above. I can't tell you how many times I've been on call 
hospital, I've been in my office, a patient comes to see me, they're asked about a specific problem and a test had been ordered and I don't have the results of that test and I have to ask that question, do I repeat the test unnecessarily or do I wait three or four weeks to try to get the results myself? I mean, we need a better, better organization to our healthcare uh, to, to help cut some of this waste out. And that's just a, a tip of the iceberg. I'm not gonna go in, that's another talk in and of itself to talk all about the waste in healthcare. Next slide, please. Okay, so we spend all this money, we do all these things, we, we must be getting something for it, right? We must be living longer, having better quality of lives than our neighbors. Infant mortality rate, United States compared to Iceland, Sweden, Japan, Finland, Norway, Denmark, and Canada. 6.8 deaths per thousand versus the others. The graph on the right shows uh, that this uh, variation is huge within our own country. The top bar is the worst 10%, the bottom bar is the best 10% mortality rate, and the average uh, in the, is shown in the middle. So there's huge discrepancy across the country. If you're in Alabama, you might have, have a higher risk of dying than if you're in Wisconsin, for example. Huge discrepancies, and we need to fix that. Next slide. And what happens, uh, uh, you know, I'm a cardiologist, Dr. Scanlon's a cardiologist, we must be saving lives in the United States, right? Mortality for acute MI, that's heart attack care versus other countries. We're at the uh, left-hand side, 5.1 uh, deaths per 100 uh, patients versus much lower death rates in other countries. We're not getting what we're paying for. We're paying more and getting less than other countries. Next slide, Will. And then our life expectancy, which would be the ultimate measure of whether we're getting anything for this. Uh, the the uh, or, organization of uh, economically developed uh, countries here, median, we're to the right of the median. How embarrassing, huh? And then when you put it all together, the healthcare spending per capita versus average life expectancy, this is sort of the graph that, that shows it all. Total expenditure per capita, we're spending over $7,000 per person on healthcare, and yet our, our age is in the 70 or 80, 80s. Uh, <coughs> compared to these other countries who spend far less and are getting more. A lot of data, a lot of information. I buzzed through it, but I hope if you, if, if you haven't already felt it in your own personal lives that healthcare is not giving you what you need, clearly if you see it here, you've got to recognize that there's things that we can work on. All right, so what happens? Next slide. We spend more, we get less. Costs are increasing exponentially with no correlation with, with good outcomes or a sense of well-being. We have access problems um, with uh, increasing numbers of uninsured and the uninsured having poorer outcomes. The individual cost uh, and the burden of the cost of care is rising with dramatic consequences on all of us. Waste is rampant in healthcare, and although I didn't show it, most of us are dissatisfied with our health care. They're, they're, you go and you wait, you, go and you don't get results in a timely fashion, your doctor doesn't answer your questions, any one of a number of reasons that you might be dissatisfied. So we, we have to improve. So is this the answer? That's the question. March 2010, President Obama signs the Affordable Care Act, go ahead, and uh, it's approved on the 23rd. What were the objectives of the Affordable Care Act? Number one, to make coverage more secure for those who have insurance and extend affordable coverage to the uninsured. Let's take care of those who need the help. Number two, improve health care quality and patient safety. Let's get a better system of providing the care. Number three, emphasize primary and preventive care. Okay, let's not spend all our money at the end of life. Let's spend it up front so we can decrease cost at the end with community prevention services. Number four, reduce the growth of health care costs. Let's Flatten that curve so it doesn't look like a ski slope, but it looks more like a mountaintop plateau. Reduce the growth of healthcare costs while promoting high value effective care. Objective E, ensure access to quality, culturally competent care for vulnerable populations. And then the last one, promote the adoption of meaningful use in health information technology as a means of, of improving coordination of care. Next slide, please. It's a big bill, 2,409 pages, which I did not read. I will not read. Um, and it's divided into 10 separate titles, and I'm not going to go through all of them here, but it's a huge bill. There's lots of information in it. There's no way I could even begin to cover it all uh, in this conversation today. So what I want to discuss is some of the highlights, the things that you've heard about, and then at the end, the parts that I didn't hit on that you want to get into more detail, we can have a, 
conversation about, and what I can't answer, Dr. Scanlon or Dr. Sickles or Dr. Sarnke or Dr. McAvoy, Dr. Hathaway, they'll all be happy to answer. <laughs> all right. So let's talk first the individual mandate. I'm sure everyone's heard about the individual mandate. Of all the, the parts of the Affordable Care Act that have raised controversy, the individual mandate is without a doubt, um, I just thought of something. You know who can really answer the questions for you? The other Dr. Hathaway, Dr. Know, Sharon Hathaway. Yeah. So, um, uh, so of all the things that have caused problems, it's the individual mandate is uh, the most controversial. And that um, is the requirement in the healthcare, and if you think back about the questions, this was the first question, uh, is that we all have health insurance. And that was challenged um, by the National Federation of Independent Businesses um, when they filed suit, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in June of 2012 uh, that this mandate that we all have insurance was indeed constitutional. It was not a slam dunk. It was a five to four vote with the conservative uh, Chief Justice Roberts joining the more liberal members of the court in support. And it upheld this uh, individual mandate to buy health insurance, um, uh, stating that it was under um, Congress's taxing power to do so. And specifically, uh, their uh, uh, judgment read the Affordable Care Act's requirement that certain individuals pay a financial penalty for not obtaining health insurance may, be, may reasonably be characterized as a tax. Because the Constitution permits such a tax, it is not our, rule, our role to forbid it or to pass upon its wisdom or fairness. So they said Congress passed it. We don't have uh, the ability to intercede. You're stuck with it. Okay? They didn't say it's good. They didn't say it's bad. They said that we can't say you can't do it. It's not. It was constitutional for the Congress to pass this. Next slide, Will. So what is it? It says that beginning January 1st, 2014, all U.S. citizens and legal immigrants must have health insurance or pay a penalty when they file their tax returns. And if they don't have health insurance, if you're an individual, you'll pay a fine, a tax, excuse me. That tax will increase over time from $95 in 2014 to 325 to $695 in 2016. And then if you're a household, you're filing as a household instead of an individual, you'll pay a penalty, uh, which will be 1% of your income, escalating on up to 2.5% of your income in 2016. All right? The individual mandate. Mm -hmm. So that So the question that he's asking, I'm inferring a little bit, but is, so you have to pay $95 as your penalty versus how many thousands of dollars for your insurance? That's a problem, right? That's a problem. So we'll, it remains to be seen what's gonna happen there. And, and the, the jury's out on that. It's, it may, it's probably not enough incentive to get people to do so. The question is, will it be enough revenue to cover the costs of, of uh, supplying health insurance for everyone? Don't have that answer, time remains to be seen. But people don't like the mandate. 66% of Americans have an unfavorable view of the mandate. But the interesting thing, only 6% will be required to purchase or face a penalty. So we all hate it. But only a few of us, maybe not any of us in here looking at the average age of the group, will be required to purchase or face a penalty. Of those two-thirds who will be required to buy it, of, I'm sorry, of that 6% who will be required uh, to buy it, two-thirds will receive a subsidy in the form of a premium credit or um, some kind of help from the government. And only 2% will have to buy the insurance uh, without any assistance. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to entice people by helping offset the, co the, the cost, and I'll show some more about that in just a minute. Okay, so this, we'll get back to that as it relates to the insurance exchanges too, and you'll see how, how and where they're gonna buy their insurance uh, now that they're being forced to do so. Medicaid expansion, this was the other one that got everyone all riled up, and I understand that like the great state of North Carolina, the great state of Wisconsin chose not to expand Medicaid. Um, I'm not gonna tell you whether I think it's good or bad. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, as a hospital administrator, not as a doctor, but as a hospital administrator, we are gonna be seeing increasing cost reimbursement declines from Medicare. And one of the ways these declines in cost, uh, the declines in reimbursement were supposed to be offset was by the expansion of Medicaid. 
So the failure to expand Medicaid kills not-for-profit hospitals like ourselves. Kills us. I can't even tell you how much it kills us. I'll tell you in a minute how much it kills us. <laughs> uh, June 28, 2012, Supreme Court ruled that forced expansion was not constitutional. What the, the bill originally said was, not only will you expand it to everyone who's uh, less than 133% of the federal poverty level, if you don't do so, then we're taking away all your Medicare, Medicaid dollars to begin with. Now understand that for every dollar your state spends on Medicaid, the federal government gives you $2. So that sounds like the best investment you could ever make, right? No. Spend one, get two. I like that, especially if I'm, I'm in trouble paying for my, my, my uh, uh, poor and uninsured in my, in my state. But what they said was if you don't spend, if you don't expand it, then we're gonna take away your other money. Supreme Court, contrary to the individual mandate, said, no go, that doesn't work. We, that's coercive. They, did, they had a lot of different opinions about why it wouldn't work, but the bottom line, it was a seven to two vote, and they said, you can't do that. So uh, they, the, they said that states could reject expansion and not lose pre-existing federal Medicaid funding. Next slide, please. Okay, so what would Medicaid expansion be if you do it? It's to expand to all non-Medicare eligible, less than 65 years of age, with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level, and understand that each state right now in the country can pick how they wanna do their Medicaid. It's a, it's a state-determined program, okay? You get federal funding, but you, you implement it and manage it at the state level. So there's different levels. It might be 200% of the federal poverty level in one state, which is what I think it is in Wisconsin, it might be you know, 150 in, in another state. All newly eligible people will get a guaranteed benchmark benefit package that meets the essential health benefits available through the exchanges. What does that mean? That means that you will be able to buy your insurance or get your insurance through the, the health exchanges and that it has to have a certain minimum amount of coverage um, to be eligible, okay? Can't be you know, a catastrophic plan only, it has to cover certain things and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And, and this was the part that kind of baffles me, is that the government said, and when you start out with this, we're gonna pay for all of it for the first three years. Every penny that it costs the states for expansion, we'll pay, pay for, for 2014 to 2016. It'll drop to 95% in 2017 and then on down the line, but in the long run, we will cover 90% of the expansion. Now that's kind of funny money, because after all, who's paying the federal taxes? We are. But nonetheless, from a state budget analysis, you invest a little bit, you get a lot back. Uh, and the other thing that they said, and this has already gone into uh, implementation, is that they were gonna increase rates for primary care physicians to 100% of Medicare rates, and that'll be federally funded too. That added expense will be funded. Um, yet, states didn't wanna do it. Next slide. Which states have uh, opted in so far? The orange ones, not moving forward. Note that my state and your state, our states were orange. Light blue, debate ongoing, and then a number of states have already opted in. What's interesting is you could opt in now and opt out tomorrow. You can opt out now and opt in tomorrow. So why not take the money for three years, figure out what you're gonna do, and then if it's working, great, and then run away later. But we're opting out. Next slide. So what are the fiscal implications for the states? And this is where there's lots of debate, whether you're on CNN or you're on Fox News, you hear a different side of the coin. I don't have an answer for it again. I, my, any of my biases have to do with my personal life as a, as a hospital administrator. <coughs> Many states would like to see net savings from the Medicaid expansion uh, by getting uninsured people into programs where they get primary care and they get better care and they're not using hospital uh, resources uh, unnecessarily. Remember, just because I'm not giving you Medicaid doesn't mean I don't have to take care of you, right? So if you don't have Medicaid, you're still gonna get sick, you're gonna come to my office, but instead of coming to my office to get preventive care, you're gonna come to my emergency department because you didn't get the preventive care in the first place. So you're gonna present later in the stage of your illness. There'll be potential positive economic uh, effects for states like jobs, revenues, economic activity. It could increase, it definitely would increase uh, revenue to my hospital, offsetting hospital uh, reimbursement reductions. The whole point of uh, allowing the, re the reductions was that we we're gonna expand coverage for everybody, more people would get paid so I'd get more money. Now I'm not gonna get that. Now I still have to take care of people and you're gonna pay me less for Medicare. Next year, my hospital, so we have $1.2 billion in net revenue, 
that's how much money we take in each year, we're gonna lose $50 million based on these things. 50, I've gotta come up with $50 million in one year in cost savings, okay? That's programs cut, that's jobs law reduced, that's more uh, uh, patients for an individual nurse to take care of, or we have to get really creative and just get rid of all the waste, which is what we're trying to do. But if I can't get a, rid of $50 million in waste, then I've gotta come up with a way to get rid of programs, and programs mean jobs, and jobs mean people's lives, and it's not a lot of fun. Some states, and this is the part where, where Fox News gets all over this one, are concerned about federal deficit reduction efforts and the implications for Medicaid. What the heck does that mean? It means that, yeah, you say you're gonna pay for 100% of it this year, 95, 93, and then 90, but what happens after that? You're gonna say, we can't keep it affording that, and you're gonna put it back on the states, and so you're gonna end up dumping on the states, it's sort of the bait and switch. Take the free money, but later on it won't be free, and then it's gonna be a problem for your state. I, I get that argument, I mean, I understand that. But I, I think in the short run, I worry more about the individual patient than I do about that, and I figure I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Next slide. Okay, coverage implications. If we did it, we'd reduce the number of uninsured, which I think is important. We'd increase access to care and limit out-of-pocket uh, burdens for low-income people. Um, we'd have improved mm -hmm. outcomes and reduced mortality. That's been shown that patients who have Medicaid versus those who don't and have the same income, the Medicaid patients have better health status. Workforce issues have to be addressed, so what if we're gonna dump all these 30 million people now in insurance, who's gonna take care of them? How many people can get into their primary care doctor right away right now? Not very many. Call up, yeah, I'm dying, my arm fell off and it's bleeding to death. Well, we'll see in three months. You know, that's, that's a problem, and now we're gonna put 30 million more people on it, so we have to address the workforce. We gotta get more primary care doctors, we have to get more access to care. We can't add people to the system without filling the system with people to take care of that. And if we fail to do this, um, we'll leave large gaps in coverage for low-income individuals with incomes below the poverty level who um, um, aren't able to access uh, subsidies to purchase health care. There'll be a group of people in a, in a window that, that, that won't get any coverage and it'll be a disaster. Next. Okay. I tried to not give a bias, but I guess I was a little bit too transparent there. So <laughs> uh, employer requirements. So we talked about the individual mandate. We talked about Medicaid expansion. Now let's look at employer requirements. What are the employers required under this new law? Employers with greater than 50 full-time employees must offer coverage or pay a fine. There's an answer to a question. Uh, and the fine, for any employee receiving a premium tax credit, hey look, it sounds like a lawyer wrote this. Pay the lesser of 3,000 for each employee receiving the credit or 2,000 for each full-time employee. Don't worry about that. What it means is that if you have anyone if you, if you have anyone and you're not offering full coverage for your full-time employees who's eligible for a tax credit, then you get fined. You have, to, you have to offer, if you have 50 employees or more, you have to offer insurance to everyone that meets the requirements such that people uh, don't have to go on the federal uh, dole. Uh, employers with greater than 200 employees must automatically enroll employees into health insurance plans. Again, and only, the only way to pay for all this is to get everyone insured, okay? If you, if you don't have all the healthy people insured and you only have the six people insured, we're doomed, okay? Um, and so they have automatic enrollment plans uh, forcing employees uh, to opt out. They have the option to opt out from getting the health insurance, uh, but they have to have um, uh, be enrolled automatically if you're a big company. Next slide, please. Next slide. That, well, here, stop here. So this is, if you go to, and I encourage you to go to this website after this talk, it's the Kaiser Family. Uh, foundation.org, kff.org, and had tremendous amounts of data, objective data about this. Um, and this is just an algorithm that says penalties for employers, and you go, does the employer have at least 50 employees? Yes, no. Does the employer offer coverage to workers? Yes, no. Does the, you know, you go all the way down the algorithm, you can figure out what, if they have to pay a fine and what that fine is gonna be. Next slide, please. We're forcing people to get to the employers above 50 to offer insurance, right? Employers less than 50, and remember, the vast majority of businesses in this country have less than 50 employers, right? So this is not gonna affect many people. The vast, vast, vast majority are small businesses. We're, that's the stick, is the forcing. This is the carrot we're encouraging them. So we're giving small business tax credits for people with less than 25 employees an average wage of less than $50,000. They'll get a tax credit if they can if they offer insurance to their 
their employees. What's the credit? 35% of the contribution uh, if they contribute up to 50% of the premium. So if I pay for half of the employee's uh, premium, um, I can deduct 35% of that. I'll get a tax credit for that. And then in 2014, I can deduct 50% of what I paid towards, towards that. So that's a pretty significant incentive. That, that's a meaningful incentive for small businesses uh, to do that. And the exact amount of the, uh, the rebate uh, uh, varies depending on how big your company is and what your wages are. Okay, mandate, Medicaid expansion, employers, health insurance exchange or marketplaces. Um, so we're asking people to be able to buy these or forcing people to, to have insurance. Where are they going to get this insurance? We create these things called health insurance exchanges. And if you don't, your state doesn't create an exchange, then the federal government's going to do it for you. When is that ever a good idea? Huh? <laughs> Letting them do it because I don't want to do it? That doesn't make sense to me. So individuals without other coverage and small employers, those that we talked about, will be able to purchase their coverage through these exchanges. It's an online exchange. You can go and compare costs of, of programs from, from a variety of different um, offerings. Now if you're trying to buy health insurance, you go to one company, say, what do you got? Go to the other, but there's no place to make good comparisons. This was designed to help people make reasonable comparisons across different um, uh, uh, programs. And it's estimated, they're hoping, that 27 million will enroll in coverage through the exchanges by 2017. Remains to be seen. All those other things we talked about and all the ifs, ands, or buts about the things we talked about will determine whether 27 million new people go into this. And there'll be premium and cost sharing subsidies for people who choose to use the exchanges. Uh, next slide, please. So they have four different plans, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. Five if you uh, count the catastrophic. Uh, and the plans uh, cover the actuarial value. This is how they have the um, the different ratings. If it's 60% of the coverage, 70%, 80%, 90 they call it platinum, gold, and silver. Um, uh, uh, next slide. And that they're required to provide ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, et cetera, et cetera. You can read on that line. Pretty comprehensive. You can't just provide a low, low, um, no coverage plan and force people to buy it. It's a pretty comprehensive plan. And how much you have to pay out of pocket determines whether it's platinum, bronze, silver, gold, and if you buy the platinum plan, it's obviously gonna cost more than the, the other plans. <laughs> Next slide, please. And you'll get a credit. So if you're really poor um, and you're uh, up to 133% of the federal poverty level, you will pay no more than 2% of your income. You'll get a credit to buy what they have is called the average of the silver plans, okay? They come up with a premium price that's the average of the silver plan. And, and you'll, you'll pay up to 2% of your income for that, and then you'll get a subsidy or a credit to help you pay the rest. If you're between 133 and 150% of the poverty level, you'll pay up to 3 to 4%. So the higher your income, <laughs> the more the, the government expects you to pay towards the plan, okay? But you get a credit. Because we don't want anyone to be forced to buy a plan and then have to pay those numbers that I showed you in the beginning of the talk, where 33% of your take-home money is going towards uh, a health insurance. That's not right. It's not, not sustainable. It's not going to work. So this is sort of the, the offset for, for that being forced, the individual mandate. We're going to help you out a little bit and make sure it doesn't kill you if you, if you can't afford it. And the, federally poverty, uh, the federal poverty level, I think for a family of four, is about $42,000. And for an individual, I think it's like eighteen or $19,000. It's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. Next slide. And this is just a much more complicated slide going through all the details of what was on that last uh, slide and just to make you show that I did a lot of work preparing for this slide. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next slide. Okay, so what happens to private insurance? Remember they say, if you got your own plan, you can keep it, it's not a big deal, right? So here it is. And this, this, most of this stuff I think you'll like. I like it. Uh, changes to private insurance. Eliminate ability for insurers to discriminate based on pre-existing conditions. What a great thing. We've needed that forever. If you have a pre-existing condition, right, prior to this, you're trapped in a job. You can't change jobs because you've got severe rheumatoid arthritis or you know some chronic medical condition, multiple sclerosis. You're stuck in that job even though you can't make enough money and you want to move. Because you've got a pre-existing condition, you know you won't get insured. That won't happen anymore, okay? That's a very, very good thing. Number two, a great thing. 
Remember all those slides I talked about that showed that uh, insurance companies were spending a lot of money on administering costs, paying their employees, paying their CEOs, et cetera, et cetera, making profits? This requires health plans to spend 85% of their premium on clinical services and quality. And I think, someone in the audience must know, I think I just saw last week that in New York State they got rebates uh, because the, um, a number of people got hundreds of dollars of rebates each because they didn't spend um, 85% on, on quality and services, so it's working. Uh, number three, insurance companies will no longer be able to just raise your rates, okay, like they did right before this went into effect. Yeah. Yeah. They can't raise your rates because there's going to be a board that says, show us you need to. And there'll be a limited amount of how high they can raise your rates. So it'll be subject to a review process. Is that good mm -hmm. or bad? I think it's good, but it sounds like more bureaucracy to me. It's, it's certainly not a free market as you might like. Adoption of financial administrative standards to promote administrative simplification. We're going to have requirements about, you know, when you get that EOB, that explanation of benefits, that either my wife, who has a jillion years of education, I have less than a jillion, one less than a jillion than she does. We can't figure out the EOB. I can't figure out the EOB. I don't know what I'm supposed to pay. That's a problem, okay? I mean, that's crazy. So we're going to try to get uh, standards to make that. This is good and bad. Cover dependent children up to age 26. I got a 22 year old, a 20 year old, a 16 year old. I just want to get out of the nest, but you know, what the heck. Uh, that's a good thing. But, um, uh, uh, you know, you'll have to grow up pretty soon. Um, they eliminate lifetime limits on dollar value coverage. There's no longer a cap, there can't be a cap anymore. Another very good thing, right? So if you, if you hit a million dollars in total expenditure because you have multiple sclerosis, then they said you're done, you're on your own, that's, that's, there's no longer a limit there. And then as we talked about before, all new policies have to meet these minimum coverage standards and uh, again, develop standards to simplify the information of benefits and coverage. So all those things I think are very great things. Medicare, what happens to Medicare? Uh, as I said, they're reducing hospital uh, payments to hospitals. And again, this could be a whole talk in and of itself. $760 billion in reductions over the next 10 to 12 years. That's real money. $760 billion. And they expect that we're going to find ways to deliver care better to offset that. And also, because of the expansion, we'll get payment from uh, the Medicaid patients. And they're going to do that by they're not going to pay right now. Uh, they, they, in many circumstances, they pay me. If you get admitted, you go home, you come back in two weeks with pneumonia, I get paid twice. So why would I want to cure you the first time, right? <laughs> now you come back, I get paid twice. You have heart failure, the best thing for you to do is keep coming back in month after month after month, I get paid. Can't, not happening anymore. You have to go home and stay home because I'm not going to get paid the next time. You have to make sure you go home with quality care. That sounds like a good thing to me. Um, and even better, let's say you come into the hospital, while you're in the hospital on your back for a while, you get a pressure ulcer on your rear end. They used to pay me for that too. So why would I roll you over so you don't get the pressure off? I'll keep you there two weeks long and keep getting paid. Not happening anymore. We, we don't get paid for any hospital acquired, or a multitude of different hospital acquired conditions. Okay, here's, here's a big one that, that you heard about and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. They're establishing the Independent Payment Advisory Board to submit legislative proposals to reduce spending growth. This is what people call the death panels, okay? They said, some independent group of 15 people, not elected people, appointed people, because they didn't want the electorate to have an influence on what people were doing, is going to make recommendations about what's going to happen uh, when Medicare spending rises too fast. Okay, they're going to be really smart people who want to do this job because it's so prestigious and it's so fun and it's so easy and they're going to pay them so much money. Not, I don't know where they're going to find the 15 people to do this. But they're going to make recommendations, and those recommendations will be either innovative ways to provide care, innovative payment models, a variety of different things, but they can't ration care, they can't increase revenues or change benefits, and they can't uh, alter eligibility or cost sharing, cost sharing meaning co-payments. They can't say, well, just make them, the, the people pay more for each of the things when you go to your office visit or your mammogram or anything like that. Uh, and it's not a death penalty. Okay, they're not going to sit there individually and say, you get this, you don't get that. But they're going to make recommendations about what's covered and what's, what's not covered. And then they'll submit these recommendations uh, uh, every other year. They're required to make the recommendations every year, other year to uh, slow the growth. They're going to allow the creation of something called an accountable care organization. 
I don't have time to talk about that. That is a really good thing or a really bad thing. It sort of sounds like HMOs on steroids to me, which makes me really nervous. Um, it sounds like a really good thing because it means a bundled payment to a group of doctors, hospitals, nursing homes to take care of a, a global illness. So instead of paying me for every little thing I do, they're gonna pay me a chunk of money for your episode of heart failure, and then I'm gonna have to figure out how to take care of you the best way I can. So the burden falls on me to provide accountable care to make the money. And that's gonna require integration of services across the spectrum. We've already seen the establishment of value-based purchasing. Value-based purchasing uh, means that the uh, Medicare dollars are attached to outcomes and patient satisfaction. We have a score that each hospital submits based on our outcomes and satisfaction. And the higher we do in that, the more money we get. I think that's a good thing. We're held accountable for providing quality care and then they're going to increase payments to primary care physicians um, and then eliminate co-pays for preventive service. So now if you get a colonoscopy or you get a, a mammogram or you get a, some uh, preventive care that's recommended by uh, the U.S. Uh, preventive Health Services, you have to pay a copay. No more copays. What do copays do? They prevent people from getting wellness visits. We're promoting wellness so that we don't have to take care of people who are sick later. Okay, next one. Okay, how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to get through in time? Uh, federal monies, we talked about that already, and then we'll, there'll be a bait and switch, we don't know. Premiums paid by citizens for health care, and those who don't, there'll be a tax, that'll be some revenue, will it be enough? I don't know. Large employers providing health insurance to employees, they'll pay for it, uh, more than 60% of the cost or face penalties, and then there'll be taxes on medical devices and pharmaceutical uh, industries. Go to the next slide for me. Um, and then back one. Um, I don't have this on here, but the medical device company is going to have a 2.3% tax on, on all, uh, I think that's what it was, a tax on all taxable medical devices. More devices are going to be put in. We're taking care of more people. Pay your share. We're not just going to give you the, the new business. You're going to have to pay some of it back. And then there's billions of dollars of fees applied to the pharmaceutical industry because more people are going to be covered billions uh, across the board, four point something annually per year over the next few years to help off offset the cost of some of this. Tax changes uh, quickly. You can't deduct over-the-counter drugs anymore from your flexible spending account or your healthcare retirement account. Uh, that's a minor deal, but it's, you know, if you're buying it, ibuprofen and writing that off, most of us have deductions that far go beyond the Motrin that we're buying. Um, There'll be an increased threshold for itemized deduction going from 7.5 to 10%. So if you have non-reimbursed costs, you can't. It, you have to hit a certain threshold of 10% of your income. Um, there'll be, uh, and this is an answer to one of our test questions. There'll be an increased tax rate on wages from uh, by 0.9% from 1.45 to 2.35. But it's only for those people making 200,000 or more as individuals, or 250,000 for those filing jointly. And then there'll be a 3.8% tax on unearned income, so dividends and investment income for these, these uh, high rollers. Next slide. Uh, oh, there's the pharmaceutical stuff I wanted to show you. So they're going to charge the pharmaceutical 2.8 for over time. And then the health insurance sector um, is also going to have some uh, fees, which is good. So pharmaceutical is benefiting. Health insurance is benefiting from this. We're going to make them pay for it. And, uh, and then the 2.2% on medical advice. Oh, and of course because you live in the great white north, 10% tax on indoor tanning, so it's <laughs> big here. All right, so. and, and I like this slide because it graphically illustrates that the tax, the added tax is the orange here. It really, it's a small amount and it hits just the ones, if you want to say, who can probably afford it most. So when you talk about it raising the taxes, it's, it's not as dramatic as you think, but it's there. I don't have time to go through that. <sighs> That's about all I know. So it looks like I figured out how to change Medicare so it finally meets its expectations. Mediocre care. All right, so we've talked about a lot. Let's see if we can answer the question. So will the health reform law require nearly all Americans to have health insurance? Yes. All right. Next. Will the health reform law establish a government panel to make decisions about end-of-life care for people on Medicare? No. No. But it does 
establish the independent payment advisory board, which remains to be seen whether they're going to be good or bad, and it remains to be seen whether anyone in their right mind would volunteer to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Will the health uh, reform law give states the option to expand Medicaid program? Yes. 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 Okay, and many have chosen not to, and what that means remains to be seen, but it hurts me as a hospital administrator. It definitely will hurt some of the underserved and uninsured in our community, and that's a bad thing for my personal opinion. Will the health reform law allow undocumented immigrants to receive financial help? We didn't touch on this. No. no. No, it has nothing to do with it. It says everyone has to be legal to get the care. It changes that, not at all. Oh, one other thing. Um, the premiums and subsidy credits for people when they're buying health insurance can't go towards abortion. That's the Hyde Amendment. They said that if you have, if the government's providing uh, health, uh, providing you health and buying your health care through the exchanges, we are not going to allow that to be put towards abortion-related services. Politics. Will the health reform law increase the Medicare payroll tax on earnings for upper Americans? That's yeah. yes. refresh your memory. Yes. Okay, next one. Will the health reform law fit the employers to pay fine if they don't offer health insurance? Yes. 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 Next. Will the health reform law cut benefits for people in the traditional Medicare program? No. It expands it. You have to pay less. You get more services. You get preventive services. It's actually a good thing. Will the health reform law provide financial help to low and moderate uh, income Americans who don't get insurance through their jobs to help them purchase coverage? Yes, yes. those are the cost premiums uh, and, and subsidies. New government run insurance, no such thing. It's not planning to provide insurance. They're using everything that's happening, not changing a thing. Answer's no. And last but not least, will the health reform law create health insurance that's changed the marketplace for small business? Yes, and we showed how they, uh, we expect them to work. <laughs> well, one more thing, I wish you all could come to this next time I get this talk, because this was the first time, the next time's all started the first time, so I apologize for experimenting on you. We have time for just a couple of questions. Yes, sir. If, if, our, if the problem with the United States is the cost is so high, why is none of that reducing the cost? Why is none of that reducing the cost? Reducing so the, the cost. So the question is whether it will or will not reduce the cost. So if, if we don't do anything, so uh, I'm not sure that this is going to give us the answer. If we don't do anything, costs will continue. Costs are going to continue to rise either way. So the hope is this, of this is that it will bend the curve, not drop the curve, OK? Um, it's a very, very good question. I don't have an answer for you. But if you, if you look at pre-reform projections for, for health care uh, over that time, it's a uh, 1 trillion dropping post-reform to 943. And the revised estimates are 922. So it does drop the projected growth, but it doesn't absolutely drop it. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'm not, I'm not sure that anyone in here today could go get an operation on their back for $32,000. It would probably be $232,000 in this area. Yeah, maybe. By the way, uh, are the other com countries that you make comparisons to, do they have an in, in, in private insurance company involvement? They do. Or, or is it all by, by government uh, uh, insurance? So it varies from country to country how much that happens. Uh, most of it is government based. We're the only, so our, our private insurance involvement grew out of the post World War II era. I don't know if you're all aware of this, but it was World War II. We had huge economic growth and expansion, actually, during World War II. Um, there was a freeze on wages during World War II. And so companies were trying to get the scarce workers who weren't off at war um, to work for them. And so one of the ways they could attract them was to provide health insurance. So they provided health insurance um, because they couldn't, there was a, a wage freeze. And then after World War II, um, the health insurance benefits weren't taxed, but wages were. So if I siphon some of my money off to you as, instead of in the form of wages, I could give it to you as a benefit. It cost me less, benefited you the same or more, and it was a win-win. So that's how this whole thing started. In, okay. in the difference in, in the- uh, In the administrative costs? In the huge, cost, yeah. huge. Yeah, I mean the profit for profit incentive sure. for the for the insurance companies. A couple more, Gene, and then we'll come here. Yeah, about about a year ago, I read this article in Forbes magazine, where.
where the writer said that the costs of Medicare will be determined by the buying public. With that in mind, I said to the doctor that we go to that we spend literally hundreds of thousands of dollars at this Marshfield Clinic. I said, here's the case. All these tests that you've given my wife, because I'm paid 100% between my two insurances, I've never even looked at the bills. I said, what are you people doing? What's to stop me from going to RMC and saying, what do you charge for an RMI? Uh, an, uh, a, an yeah. So in other words, are you, people, yeah, are, are, are you people as a hospital? He said, we're already doing that. We're looking into that situation right now. I mean, you're sort of referring to that Time uh, magazine article. I was in Forbes. But yeah, the, time, time, right time in Forbes. It's a big, big on transparency of costs. And mm -hmm. the, the problem is, You'd like to say that that will change. I mean, if, if people had individual skin in the game, they would direct their, their, their care more appropriately, most of the time. But that assumes you have the ability and the opportunity to do so, okay? When you're having a heart attack, you're not going online and saying, yeah. I'm going to RMC, I'm going to Sean, I'm going to the medical center. You know, you're going. You're going fast. And, and so for a lot of stuff that's not elective, and then convenience, Overweigh that. You know, you've got limited area where you're going to do that. So, it, market forces don't apply as much as we like them to in healthcare, which is a which is a problem. And that's why it'd be nice if there were some standardization across systems about that. But you know, when I when I'm taking care, one of the things people don't realize is that for so in our hospital, we have um, 70 to 72 percent of our patients are Medicare, Medicaid, or no pay, and. 30, so the remaining 28% are commercial insurance. I can't turn a dollar on the Medicare, Medicaid patient. They pay me less than it costs me to do it. Now, what's the problem there? That I don't provide care in a cost-efficient fashion or they're not paying me enough or both? It's probably somewhere in between, okay? But that means I've got to make all the money that I make on that 28%. So who's paying for that? You know, anyone with commercial insurance. It's called cost shifting. And that means in order to pay for the neonatal care, I've got to, I've got to charge you know, the healthy people $195 for a mammogram, even though it cost me $30 to do or something. You know, so there's, a, there's complicated reasons why we have these problems. And that's why, I dare say this in front of my father, you know, a single payer a universal health care system would probably be a good thing. But that's another story altogether. Not <laughs> correct. So many people have waivers. Congress is opting out. I've been opt out the federal government. And so Congress does not opt out. They they have to participate just like everyone else. That's a myth. They're, they're not. They, well, they, the journals today, they opted out, right? The Congress did it on the last minute before they took their five-year vacation. They exempted the federal employees. They just did it like yesterday. Oh, nice. And then uh, the only way they're going to get of course, right? Who's the, if I, get, I mean, I pay a fraction, I get away with it, and then when I get sick, I go and I get taken care of anyway. I mean, it's 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 a problem. I agree. No, one more question, and then our a follow-up. Okay. Uh, also, they didn't do anything allowing people to negotiate with drug companies for drug prices. Why do we have yeah. price in America? Why don't we have a single fare that would bring the cost down from 15% to 9%? There's a lot of ways to correct that. Yeah, they, they are going to be cut down on the donut hole. So those of you who find yourself stuck in the donut hole on Medicare Part D, that won't be completely eliminated. You'll have to pay 25% of the cost in the future, but they're going to shift a lot of it more towards generic uh, meds uh, rather than the, uh, the brand The final thing is we have a Cadillac system going to our hospital that's probably better than 99% Maybe we get along with a Chevy rather than a. Uh, <laughs> One more question, then, but and then we're going to. Uh, I'm sure Doctor might hang around. Oh, sure. Around to yep. cuff. But when you exit tonight, exit carefully. We're we're crammed in here. Let's not uh, start with the chair removal until we accomplish some of the uh, people <laughs> removal. One last question. Uh, yeah. One of your slides talked about the importance of. But I've seen a number of 
list of articles where the data collection and the paperwork has gotten where the doctors have to go through a list for billing purposes that has quadrupled what even Medicare does now. You can't just have... We can't hear in the back, so make the question as short as possible. Okay, uh, instead of administrative simplicity, what I hear is that the data collection and the paperwork has quadrupled, that the doctors have to go through a list it's not just a dog bite. Is it your dog? Is it your neighbor's dog? Yeah. Is it what kind of dog? Is it a so, pit bull? So what you're referring to is the, the DRG system, and it's expanding from about 1,000 different diagnoses to 10,000 different diagnoses. And it, it, it again. So how can you have administrative simplicity when you have people that you've got to hire now? That, that specifically was referring to what you see in terms of explaining what the benefits of the cost plan would be and what the coverage would be. Not what I have to do to get paid to do it. We thank you for coming. Oh, yeah.